some debate as to whether the Book of Esther is historical or possibly written as a play or an allegory. Haman's 75-foot gallows, the difficulty in establishing which king, and more notably, which queen, Esther's story describes, and the depiction of a few unlikely scenes, such as a massive three-day civil war, which is completely absent from Persian sources, move many scholars to suggest Esther is a dramatized story. That said, I'm going to treat the story as it is presented, because whether it's a dramatized history or a historicized drama, the author was seeking to convey something really important about the grand narrative of heaven and earth. Haman is the depiction of evil. Esther and Mordecai portray the best of God's own people. Queen Vashti is the dignity of the surrounding nations, and Xerxes displays the dangers of worldliness and power. We're going to see that God prepares Esther for a pivotal role in saving the nations in Esther 1-2. through Then we'll watch the development of Haman's evil plot and Hester's wise plan in Esther 3 through 7. And then we'll end up with the first joyful festival of Purim in Esther 8 through 10. So let's begin with God preparing Esther. The book of Esther belongs toward the end of the Jewish captivity. So sometime in the years between chapters 6 and 7 of the book of Ezra, if you ever read the book of Ezra, you'll see right where it lands. There had been a remnant of Jewish people who had long since gone back and the temple had already been rebuilt when Esther's story was written. However, most of Israel's and Judah's descendants, whether rightly or wrongly, chose not to return to their inheritance in the Promised Land, and their lives have been successfully reestablished throughout the Persian Empire. Esther's story opens with a young King Xerxes. This happened in the days of Ahasuerus, the same Ahasuerus who ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in the citadel of Susa in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his officials and ministers. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were present. Now, there are several men identified in scripture as Xerxes or Ahasuerus. Not all the same man, because this is a common title. It's like Tsar or Shah or Pharaoh, and it means the venerable father. Some biblical historians identify this emperor as the 20-year-old Xerxes who was beginning his six-month-long planning of an enormous military expedition against Greece that his father Darius had begun, but died before he could finish. The ancient historian Herodotus told several stories that depicted Xerxes' ferocious anger. Here's just one. Part of his military strategy to conquer Greece was to build a bridge over the Hellespont, a channel of water, and it took enormous amounts of manpower and resources, and when the bridge was finally complete, a great tempest broke it up into smithereens. Xerxes was furious, so he had the water scourged with 30 lashes, then he threw a pair of fetters, which are handcuffs, into the Hellespont, had branders brand the water with their irons, and then he personally cursed the water. Finally, he had all the bridge designers and builders beheaded. Then he said, okay, who would like to help me start over and build a new bridge? Of course, everybody took a giant step backwards. Nevertheless, Herodotus described Xerxes as not only impetuous and passionate, but also the handsomest of all the kings. So imagine that Xerxes in the following scene. On the seventh day, when the king was merry with wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who attended him to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing the royal crown, in order to show the peoples and the officials her beauty. For she was fair to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command conveyed by the eunuchs. At this the king was enraged, and his anger burned within him. She was thankful to get away with her life, Nevertheless, Vashti was summarily deposed to make an example of her and to humble all the wives of the Persian Empire. Now, according to these same biblical historians, there was now a four-year pause during which Xerxes campaigned against Greece and suffered colossal defeat. Herodotus records that Xerxes then retired from public life for a while, and he had a renewed fascination in his harem. And so Esther continues, After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. 
Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. Soldiers searched every house. Jewish tradition holds that Mordecai actually tried to hide his orphaned cousin. Hadassah, as she had been named from birth, was a typical Jewish girl, except for her exceptional beauty. Especially as an orphan, imagine what her young hopes and dreams must have been. To marry a wonderful Jewish man, to be made one flesh and, and one in spirit, as the ancient scriptures described. She must have dreamed about raising a family, maybe a large family, taking them to worship every Sabbath, teaching them about God, teaching them in the scriptures. Think about Hadassah's dreams. The day the soldiers took her from her home, she became Esther, a Persian name that means star. Think of the countless stars in the night sky. At the very least, she would lose her virginity unwillingly and become a concubine, one little star among so many sentenced to life hidden away in Xerxes' harem. At best, she would become the head wife to an idolater, her children all raised by other idolaters. Mordecai warned her not to reveal her faith or her people, and that was evidence of the great prejudice against the Jewish people. Esther's dreams, Hadassah's dreams, were crushed forever. Esther was a picture of her people, beautiful, faithful, submissive, of good character. Having been planted in a foreign land, they continued to worship and have faith in God, remembering God's lasting covenant with them as God's people, but quietly, because they also lived in a land hostile to God. Esther was admired by all who saw her. The king loved Esther more than all the other women. Of all the virgins, she won his favor and devotion, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. True beauty is found in a humble spirit. Hadassah, who had become Esther, chose to trust God and obey God, even when God took away all her dreams. She could have been bitter and resentful, but she chose not to be. She was so pleasant and sweet and humble, she charmed everyone who knew her. When she arrived at the palace, she was modest and teachable. She did not ask for many of the things that the others had insisted upon. And in the same way that Esther did not mention her faith, so God is not mentioned in her story. But God's hand was still at work, even though unseen, because not only did Xerxes choose Esther, but when the virgins were being gathered together, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Now this is possibly a reference to Mordecai having become a judge because of Mordecai's access and position in the palace. He eventually overheard two officials, possibly Vashti's supporters, plotting Xerxes' assassination in retaliation for choosing a new queen. The officials were hanged, and the whole story recorded. But now comes Haman's plot and Esther's very wise plan. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and did obeisance to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance. Haman embodied anti-Semitism at its worst. He had been recently elevated to prime minister, and he felt it his due that every person was to bow down to him. So just like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in faithfulness to God, Mordecai would not bow down to Haman because Persians believed kings and high officials were divine. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance to him, Haman was infuriated. But he thought it beneath him to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So, having been told who Mordecai's people were, Haman plotted to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, through the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Now, there is an interesting aside here. Mordecai was of the tribe of Benjamin, King Saul's tribe, and Haman was a descendant of Agag, Saul's opponent, and Amalekite, the first people who attacked the Jews in, in the Exodus. Haman was the sworn enemy of God, exalting himself and despising God's people. And now we get to the heart of Esther's story of how the Lord is the triumphant savior of God's people in a land hostile to God. Because when Saul tried to wipe out the Amalekites, he sinned in two ways. 
he took the loot for himself, and he refused to kill King Agag. Now hang on to that. At the end of this story, we're going to see those two wrongs made right before God. So Haman told Xerxes that a certain people, Mordecai's people, were a threat to the king's authority. He suggested that if Xerxes would remove them and trust Haman, Haman would make him rich, and he began by offering the equivalent of $10 million. The couriers went quickly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Mordecai must have realized that his own actions involved the entire nation. I wonder if he wondered whether God had meant him to go that far. Enormous consequences for taking a seemingly small stand for what's right. I think we fear the same thing today. We watch people being vilified in the news for trying to publicly live out faith, taking stands on social and political issues. How much, we might think, should I accommodate the culture I live in? What will happen to me and to my family when I take a stand? How will what I do reflect on other Christians or on Christianity or on Jesus? So because of his palace access, Mordecai knew all about what had happened, and he put on sackcloth and ashes in mourning. And then he urged Esther to approach the king. Esther's hesitation is understandable. She knew Xerxes. He had not called her for over a month. She would literally be risking her life. And then Mordecai replied with what the heart of this whole story contains. Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter. But you and your family's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Mordecai must have known the scriptures because his faith was firmly settled in God. The Lord had made an everlasting covenant with God's people, and even though they were now in exile, God was still their God. When God heard the groaning of the Hebrews enslaved in Egypt, God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Throughout the ensuing centuries, time and again, the Lord would remember God's covenant with God's people to bless and to protect, also to discipline and to judge. And now Mordecai counted on God to rescue the people from otherwise sure destruction. It was clear to Mordecai how God had guided the events of their lives, Hadassah to become queen, Mordecai to judge in the king's gate to save the king's life. Now it was in the hands of the king to save the lives of their people. And it was Esther's privilege to play a part in God's deliverance. It would come at great risk, and it would cost her all the political capital she had. But it underscores the truth that God's deliverance, though sure, involves taking risks of faith. If Esther had refused, God would have saved the people in some other way. Only now Esther would lose the blessing. The same is true for you and me today. God has shaped us for the opportunities God brings. You and I are here now by God's appointment. And so Esther rose to God's call. Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace opposite the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne inside the palace opposite the entrance to the palace. And as soon as the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won his favor and he held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. And then Esther approached and touched the top of the scepter. Sensitive to God's timing, Esther the queen disarmed both the king and the prime minister, and then she waited. God worked through the night, for Haman became overconfident and built the gallows that would mean his own demise, and King Xerxes also had a sleepless night, and so he had an attendant read to him from his chronicles, and he came to remember that he owed his very life to Mordecai. And what ensues is a fantastic 
series of coincidences all happening in a row. Haman just happened to be waiting in the hall at this very moment when the king needed good counsel. Think how dramatically the tables turned in one short night. Haman described all the things he would have loved in being publicly honored by the king, and then Haman was sent to publicly honor Mordecai, whose own faithfulness to God in refusing to bow down to Haman is what prompted all of Haman's evil deeds. God was at work, honoring Mordecai for his faithfulness, as the proverb had said. God mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. And later, a person's pride will bring humiliation, but one who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. This truth was often taught to encourage the first century church. Listen to Matthew. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Luke also said, He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. And James wrote, But the Lord gives us more grace. That's why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And the apostle Peter, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. God had now prepared the people and the setting. That night, the timing was perfect as the small party were reclining on couches, enjoying the banquet. Xerxes especially was full of good food and good feelings towards Esther. So Hadassah, who was now Esther the queen, pled with her king to save her people. Xerxes hadn't even known who the people were that Haman had asked to exterminate, but now he saw in horror it touched his beloved wife. And now a new, perfectly timed series of events all happened, falling one after another so that Xerxes, who had left the room deeply troubled and greatly distressed, returned to see the hapless Haman falling on his queen. Could it get any worse? Yes, a servant comes in and tattles on Haman about his 75-foot gallows, specially erected to hang the very person the king had just honored for saving his life. Well, now we come to the great festival, but first there would be a terrible battle. Instead of losing her life, or at least ruining her marriage by divulging her secret, Esther received all of Haman's property and a promise from her king to help her people. Instead of being hanged on the gallows and being the reason for the annihilation of all the Jewish people in Persia, Mordecai was now raised to the highest position in the palace, second only to the king. The edict could not be undone, but the king enabled the Hebrew people within his realm to defend themselves. As Christians, you and I see an even deeper, more sinister plan than Haman's plan exposed. Because the serpent of old, ever watchful for an opportunity to destroy the seed of the woman, had nearly triumphed in Egypt through crushing enslavement of God's people and the death of every Hebrew baby boy. Now, through Haman's scheme to wipe out the Hebrew people that would have meant to wipe out the line of Messiah. Even Esther could not have known the scope of God's deliverance in this hour, the eternal cosmic significance of her act of risky faith. Two important acts are recorded in chapter 9. The first is found in verse 13, where all the sons of Haman, descendants of King Agag, were hung on the gallows. The second is repeated in verses 10, 15, and 16 the Hebrew people made a point of not taking any plunder. And so finally, the ancient King Saul's sins were put to right. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in the open towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day of gladness and feasting, a holiday. Purim stems from the word pur, meaning dice, which were thrown to decide which day to annihilate the Jewish people. Now it had become a day to celebrate, a day of showing generosity and deep concern for others, of sending gifts to the poor. It was a day of victory in God. The Lord is faithful to keep God's covenant with God's people. Even though the people had not returned to the land of promise, they remained the people of God, and God was with them, and God was there to deliver them. But even more so, if you place this story against the backdrop of Eden, 
you and I can see the ancient serpent's enmity in the evil Haman. Evil's enemy is portrayed in the good Hadassah, her dreams crushed, yet willingly letting go of the life she had hoped for to live the real life as Esther that God had given her. And we also see evil's enemy portrayed in the good Mordecai, who had wisdom, integrity, and unshakable faith. The prophesied seed was carried in the people of God whom God rescued, and the grand arc of salvation is carried through from the Hebrew Scriptures into the Christian Testament.